Anyway, so Grant, Grant Moon has written this wonderful book on uh, Big Big Train. I'm just interested, how much input did you have uh, into this book? Um, well, actually, we um, the book is being published by a publishing house, which I partly own with um, Big Big Train manager Nick Shilson. So in that respect, quite a lot of, um, of involvement. I think one of the main things that I was seeking to do um, was to avoid a conflict of interest. In other okay. words, I didn't want editorial control or anything of that nature. So it was very much um, up to Grant to to deliver the text, um, and you know, with us having have no editorial control at all, really. Um, but of course, it involved. I don't know how many interviews I did for it. I mean, I'm the I'm the kind of um, uh, the only band member that's been there right from the start. So probably, I guess, something like 40, 50 hours of interviews. Um, but firstly with Nick Shilton, who started writing the book. Um, and then uh, with Grant, who it was handed on to um, sort of fairly early on in the process. So uh, quite a big involvement, but hopefully, or definitely not in an editorial sense. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, an unvar it's as unvarnished as it can be um, in terms of the story of the band. Well, was it strange sort of delving back, you know, into the, all the nooks and crannies of this band's past? Yeah, it was. And um, it's been a long, it's been a long old road and it's been mainly bumps <laughs> rather than road, really. Um, it was, it became almost, um, so the way it would work was initially when I was meeting with Nick Shilton, who lived close enough um, to make things happen, we would meet in a coffee bar in Winchester. Mm -hmm. uh, then when it hand was handed on to Grant, partly because it was through the COVID era um, and partly because of geographical distance, it was done via Zoom or, or FaceTime. But I found it, um, uh, it became almost like a, a sort of... Um, yeah, it was cathartic and it was almost like, it, it, I mean, what I was trying not to... It, 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 for a while, it started to feel like I was talking to a counsellor almost, you know, that you were sort of working through some of the issues in your mind that maybe plagued you for all your life. I mean, it has been a kind of a, a life's work for me, this band, crazily. And um, so there was an element of the psych psychologist couch. There was an element of um, of counselling. Uh, it was cathartic, um, you know, and it was, yeah, it was fun, actually. It was quite fun to look back and realise quite <laughs> what a twisty tale it's been. Yeah, I mean, it's a wonderful book, though. I mean, I take it you've seen the finished product. I mean, you must be very pleased with it. So I've seen a screen print of the finished product. It's being it's being printed up at the moment. So yes. of course, me being me being a very sort of bookish type of fellow, I'm I'm waiting to to feel the um the final uh, well, the tactile relationship. Really. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So I hope that, that they do a good job on the printing. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it's very difficult for me to be objective because it's it's the story of of big big train and it's it's uh -huh. therefore it's partly my story but i think grant's told it extremely well uh mm -hmm. he's a really talented writer and um i think whilst you know you can't run away from the fact we're not genesis or super tramp or whatever we don't have that sort of um you know rags to stadium uh story but we have a kind of rags to you know double denim kind of tale i suppose where it's um it's of it i think it's of interest to a lot of people and, I, and one thing i noticed when i was at the one of the later prog music awards things i was when i first started attending those i was like talking to you know peter hamill and other artists that i kind of was in awe of and in the later ones people were coming up to me not that they were in awe of me but because they wanted to know how have you done it you know mm -hmm. how did the band which is a kind of fairly traditional uh, prog rock um, band. How did you achieve the sort of profile that you've done? So it's quite interesting to feel a sort of twist or change in perception about Big Big Train um, over the years. You know, because yeah, it's been it's been a long road, and it's been it's been good to see that um, the story has um, evolved into something that's um, had a bit more heft to it. I think. Sure. Sure. Um... Uh, not so long ago, I spoke to Mark Kelly, and he said, um, from Meridian, of course, and he said that listening to Rick Wakeman's Journey to the Centre of the Earth was a seismic moment for him. It made him want to play keyboards. What album in your past is the one that made all the lights go on and, and made you want to be a musician? I was selling by the pound, undoubtedly. Um, my brother, uh, who's five years older than me, um, and therefore was a bit further on in, in um, his musical taste, um, 
he went to go and uh, he went with his mates to go record shopping, maybe 77, something like that, 78. Um, and uh, his mates were trying to get him to buy Nevermind the Bollocks. Um, uh-huh. But instead, he came back with um, selling England by the pound. Bless him. Nigel, my brother, then went on to become a, a sort of new wave um, punk fan. But this album he brought home, he would um, had a little house, but he would lie in the bath, all the doors open and put his record player up to kind of 11. Um, and I was walking up the stairs one day and um, with Nigel in the bath and... Um, I heard this little guitar figure uh, from Dancing with the Moon at Night. Da, 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 da. And it was just, it was that little phrase. It was that one, it, it literally stopped me in its tracks. Um, yeah. And I've been brought up with um, church music and um, singing in a choir. And also my, my parents liked, um, my dad liked Holst. So we had the planets. And so we had a, had a kind of a, backdrop of of um sort of instrumental music with great tunes um but also some good pop music as well and then this seemed to almost bring the two things together you know it was always almost it it, it combined two worlds for me yeah. um and so that was that was the moment and um nigel i was talking to him about it and he's saying that there were songs that were 10 minutes long it was intriguing utterly intriguing for a 12 year old kid and um yeah that was definitely the moment the sort of light went on for me that's well, absolutely. I mean, you've more or less answered another question I had uh, lined up for you, and that was, uh, um, I've always rightly or wrongly drawn parallels to the Eng- that English pastoral prog of Genesis and Big Big Train. I was going to say, how big, a, a big an influence were those albums overall as a development on your sound, uh, the Steve Hackett's playing? And we're talking, the, uh, oh, yeah, we're talking yeah. prim- primarily the Gabriel era Genesis here. No, actually, no. Um, I, I think we... My love for Genesis kind of probably came crashing to an end, Invisible Touch era. Um, before then, it was the pastoral 12-string sound that Anthony Phillips and Mike Rutherford developed. I think that was the main thing for me, that the, the kind of magic that the two of them weaved with those 12 strings, and then you had the Mellotron on top of that, and then the sudden build into the sort of big songs that they were able to deliver. So they've been... I think the touchstone um, for me as a prog rock outfit and primarily because they're just great songwriters, you know, that's the crucial thing, Um, you know, brilliant songwriters Uh, and amongst all the instrumentation and cleverness and beauty is the songwriting that, um, that, that is most important to me. From there, I went on to Van de Graaff, the, the sort of dark side of prog, I suppose. They uh, love them, PFM, etc. cetera. Um, um, so, but I can't get away from the fact that Genesis were the most influential on my writing. And certainly when my writing began to find its own sort of voice, I suppose, I think that was probably the, the biggest influence that I drew from. And then like all musicians it becomes a melting pot you know you 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 know you grab a bit of genesis here and you grab a bit of more contemporary sounds over there mu or whatever um and then it becomes something different and that's no different from um you know maybe yes or you talked about interviewing steve howe you know they were pulling together you know uh, sort of um, almost film music scores into their songs and creating this new sort of new combination of sounds. So all bands go through that process and um, certainly Genesis is probably the biggest uh, in, the biggest influence on us. Well, Steve Howe says that um, Chet Atkins uh, still mm. kind of hovers over him and informs his, his playing in a way. Um, uh, would you say you've kind of um, moved away from that Genesis influence or, or, or is, it, is it still very much apparent in, in the way you compose or the way you think when you write? Um, I think I've, I've, what, big, what happens is you find your own voice yes. um, and it took me a long, long time to do that. I was a very late starter with songwriting um, and I was really terrible at it in the early days. And then I think probably from Gathering Speed. I, Gathering Speed, I really went down the whole 12 string and um, genesis thing. And then after that, I began to find um, a way of um, combining chords and influences, which I think was, yeah, you can hear the influences in there, but I think it's unique. Um, and again, the brass band, bringing in different sounds and elements yeah. um, has helped to give us a sort of unique sound in the in the contemporary music world. So mm-hmm. I, it's not, you know, I, I don't sit I don't sit down and think, oh, I want to write a song that sounds a bit like, 
you know, yeah. so and so. It's just it comes from here or it comes from the fingertips, and um, you know, it ends up sounding like it does. I think with David, ironically, David's voice um, kind of sat somewhere between Peter Gabriel and Phil Collins. So, of course, with my chord sequences and melodies and David's voice, it certainly drew in the, the sort of Genesis crowd. Um, mm. But I'd like to think that we've kind of, you know, that's part of our story and we've sort of moved into our own musical world now, which is hopefully unique. OK, um, well, you played your first gig, 3rd of December 1991 at River Park Pub. Mm. Uh, what memories do you have of that night? They're all they're all. They all get conflated together. I can't remember. In fact, it was Andy that reminded me or, or tracked down that that first gig because um, I was I was at a loss to it. I just remember a load of local pubs here. I'm yeah. not a local born Mothian. Um, I'm from the Midlands, so therefore I, I, my my geography of the area at the time, I was fairly yeah. newly moved down, wasn't great, and so therefore I was just sort of rocking up to these pubs and and playing gigs. Um, I, I remember. I mean, we, it was very really rough. I remember playing, I think it was the first gig, there were a bunch of girls in the audience and they were very drunk. And I remember them coming up to us afterwards and saying, um, oh, you're as good as some of those London bands. And we really like you. I mean, they'd had, really had too much to drink. Um, <laughs> so you get a little, some little feedback early doors that, you know, okay, there's maybe a bit of potential. But for the most part, it was a slog. It was a, you know, we, we ended up moving from, the local that old bands from the local gig circuit. We go we, the raw stand at Walthamstow became a sort of a, a hunting ground for us, and also we had a couple of sort of fairly dreadful festivals. One in Stoke, I remember very, very, uh, very well, um, and we got a little bit of support from the Classic Rock Society as well. They were great. Um, so it was kind of it was like all bands. It was driving around. We didn't do many gigs in those days, but it was driving around in uh, you know crunched up with your amps around your ears. Yeah. Uh, getting home at four o'clock in the morning and then having to get up for work at um, at seven thirty. So it wasn't, you know, I, I I don't look back that fondly on it if I'm honest. No. But it was just part of um, part of the learning of the process, I suppose. Yeah, part of the journey. Um, much of this band's aesthetic seems to be concerned with the romance of the early industrial world. I mean, why is that? Well, I think it goes back. I think there's some DNA in it because it my my um, my family were all on the railways. Um, okay. in Leicester so yeah. therefore I had a, a uncles and, and granddads who were uh, railway based um, my mum used to tell me tales of um, you know of, of I mean in the very loose health and safety she'd go down and cross over the lines and go and have um, sandwiches with her dad in uh, in this little signal box or, or whatever it was and you know so I had I think we had a lot of those early family tales really um, and then I've got a, I, I, my degree is in archaeology, and whilst I sort of um, focused on Roman archaeology and um, prehistory, I began to get a feel um, for the uh, the interest there is in um, the industrial age, or the just pre-industrial age as well. So, and and then you begin to get a feel for the communities involved in, um, you know, those incredible. Uh, you know, incredible businesses and industries, mm -hmm. um, the making of the railways, the coal and the, the shipbuilding, all of those things. And, that, you know, they're, they're part of um, the nation's backstory, really. And the, the interesting thing for me, I found over the years that as we started to write more and more about those things, the, the contacts we'd get from abroad, um, where, you know, most industrial societies have been through that similar stage or phase where, you know, communities became focused on particular things like shipbuilding or whatever um, and so of course those stories are through the families and um, mm. and they do resonate with people and, and that's what we were finding that we were telling these tales of um, of the industrial age and people were actually um, you know beginning to find them you know their own part of their own story in there I suppose mm. um, so yeah it became a big a big part of our kind of developing um, sound or identity I think yeah. Uh, interesting though, your subject matter as a band, uh, do you not think that makes you um, very, a bit like the Kinks, really, a very intrinsically English band, not not so much of a transatlantic sound? Yeah, I think it does. Um, I think it's um, it's interesting talking to Nick Divisioni about this because he's because him being brought up in the sort of um, 
world of genesis as well and and in those english beatles kinks sort of bands yeah. you know that you do very much get that there is a love for um songs about those subjects um and and so yeah we did we did end up being seen you know, I hate the phrase but sort of quintessentially kind of english i suppose um despite the fact that we've got a multi and have had for a long time a multinational lineup you know oh, but i yeah. think as i say i think it's because every country uh, has their own backstory which is of not too dissimilar and i think they sort of relate back to you know the 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 story of britain the story of england um as being one that's fairly well known across the world um so yeah i'm i'm, I'm pleased that we've you know i'm pleased that we've got that the brass band of course being another massive yeah. element of that because when, when you combine the stories and then the, you you import the sound from those communities and that's very much is the sound from those communities then i think you create something that is inevitably going to be very much um you know people will be sort of dialed into that sort of mind mindset and um those worlds yeah yeah uh, interesting reading the back to the book uh, it says in the book i don't know if you said it or someone else but the bard was described as wallpaper music. Uh, did the band at that point sail perilously close to breaking up? And, and what do you think went wrong with that album? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree. It's um, it's a it's another another re another review said it was Sunday morning music, whatever that means. So I think it was just basically not very rocky and not very um, um, not very interesting. I think. No. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I was we were. I mean, I I'd, I'd recently got divorced. Um, it was just it was just back to me and Andy, really. Um, um, we were living. We had a, a little dining room in this house here that um, that we converted into a home studio. That was when we bought because up to then we've been working out of um, Twenty Four Truck Studios with Rob Aubrey, and and he suggested, look, if you're going to make one more album, then it's actually going to be probably better for you if you buy the studio kit. And then you can sell it afterwards, um, you know, because it will still retain a high value. So that's what we did, really. Um, and the kids, my kids then were sort of three or four years old and they thought Andy lived here. Mm -hmm. um, they just said it's Andy's room because he just was in and out at all hours of the day and night learning how to, to record, you know, how to, to become an engineer, really. So we, you know, we sort of battled our way through, um, through Bard and... Um, sold 300 copies and for some bizarre reason decided to carry on I, I don't know why i just think because neither of us had anything else that you know outside of family and and um and and lovers you know we had nothing else that that made us tech i suppose so we just oh. thought all right there's, there's enough of an audience to, to carry on and um so we did, but it was definitely a, in every respect, it was a low point album, um, sales wise, emotionally wise, everything. You know, it was um, def so that's probably why I can't, I couldn't even contemplate um, listening to it, if you sort of mean. Um, but we were, I, we're trying to get a limit. It makes it into the set list these days, then. Well, actually, I'd like to play The Last English King. I've always liked that song. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I think that, that it may be going forward that we will bring one or two songs back in. Uh, mm -hmm. And we are going to do a limited edition reissue of it um, just so it's out there because I know it's getting, you know, people are spending 100 quid or something on the few thousand copies that were made, and that's, that's silly. Um, we could yeah. get it remixed and, and out for people. Um, but it won't be our latest release on Spotify, if you see what I mean. It's, it's, it's always going to be part of the backstory and, and nothing else, I think. Right, right. Um, uh, interesting, the, the Difference Machine, uh, you know, it's a, a pretty cosmic album. I just wonder, were you listening to a lot of uh, Van de Graaff Generator when you were writing that? Yeah, the Stacks Office we brought in, I, that was his, that was his re you know, well, the request that we made to him, go and listen to David Jackson. Oh, you know, okay. I didn't want I didn't want Baker Street. You know, I wanted mm -hmm. um, some dirty kind of slightly atonal sounds from the sax. He was great. He went away mm -hmm. and listened to those things and um, and delivered really. We were also listening to the Mars Volta at the time. We went to see the Mars Volta and we were really blown away by them. They're, they're just very sort of fluid and um, interesting take on prog, I think. Um, so that went that album went a certain direction. I don't, I don't know why it did. It became quite spacey, and we we then we bought um, when we went to see the Mars Volta. They had this thing called the Chaos Pad, yeah, um, which is a 
cool bit of equipment and, and it was it enabled you to kind of play with sound a little bit mm -hmm. and um and do some interesting things and so we got quite experimental for a little while um and that was a fun album to make i really enjoyed it. i think it's a really strong album as well i think some good songs on there and um sort of transitional for us because nick was beginning to come on board at that stage um but i yeah i i like the different stream it's good stuff it's interesting you mentioned um a spotify just a little bit early i mean uh uh, Roger Daltrey has described Spotify as just uh, uh, um, sanctioned theft, <laughs> basically. I just wonder how you feel. Although I imagine the Who do rather better out of Spotify than a lot of bands. I wonder how do you feel about the way artists uh, are just paying? I, yeah, I think it's the. Um, I don't. I think there's this. The problem is for some artists um, that I discuss things with is that they've got this impression that there's all, that that there was this kind of period of time that was great for for bands of a certain mm -hmm. level and there's never been there has never been a period of time when bands of the middling to lower order are you know are doing well are, are well paid you know it just doesn't it's never been like that so mm -hmm. you, you in the 70s bands were you know they were the record companies were obviously the, the you know the selection device as to what bands did or didn't do well but so many bands were ripped off back then yeah. uh, and you always had a stage where you had a few elite artists pink floyd led zeppelin genesis you know artists with really powerful managers mm -hmm. who were able to kind of make the music industry work for them rather than the other way around yeah. So I, I don't I'm not nostalgic about um, about this. I, I don't you know, I, I think if, if Big Big Train was around in the mid 70s, one bit of me says, oh, we could have been really successful. The other bit of me realizes that, you know, we'd still have got to got through a gatekeeper the the, um, you know, the record company, we wouldn't have been able to afford to make albums and release them ourselves. You know, that was way out of the uh, out of the reach of bands of our level back then. Um, and we wouldn't be able to, you know, we wouldn't have a distribution network through Spotify streaming where people can listen to us across the world, you know. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not, I, I prefer to deal with the world as it is, not as I'd like it to be, you know. And, and whilst I would wish that Spotify and other streaming services paid artists more and they should do, um, it kind of is what it is. And I think we should make noise about it. But I'm, we're not a band that's going to move away from streaming services because the reality is, that's where it is to do anything else is just becoming king can you you know you're not yeah. going to take time about the tide of that well uh, gene simmons attributes um uh, file sharing and, and things like that as as the nail in the coffin for rock music uh do you think yeah I, th I think i'm more angry about um file sharing um yeah. much more angry about that period um you know when the internet it really was the wild west and when the internet um uh you know when people first started really adopting file sharing um that was when things were really unfair because then you didn't have a choice in it you know it was yeah. theft um and it, it was totally soul destroying and one of the things that really has pissed me off is when uh you know we had an argument with somebody i just think a year or two ago actually um whereby promo cds go out the journalist whoever it was isn't that interested or just rips it and then sells it into a, a, a second and record store. And we found instances where, you know, CDs were going into record stores, secondhand copies yeah. um, before release date. And of course that's a disaster for us because that yeah. could, you know, that could get spread around via, by YouTube or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what really winds me up. It's that sort of thing, but, but um, you know, the Spotify, et cetera, I, I prefer not to get annoyed about it. I prefer just to accept it for what it is and, and it's our job to build that audience and to, you know, make sure the audience is big enough for us to be able to gig more and, you know, make, make money on T-shirts and things like that to, to keep the band, band going forward. Okay, well, interestingly, uh, Jeff Barton, I think of classic rock, uh, called The Underfall Yard, an Anglo-prog masterclass pack full of tall tales and deep laments. Uh, when you were making this album, did you feel that, uh, wow, we're doing something really special here? Or was it just the kind of next album? I think we knew it was a good, it, we knew it was a strong set of songs. Yeah. Um, there were songs like Winchester Diver, which I was extremely proud of and still am to this day. And of course we had the, the long piece of music, the, the title track as a kind of, you know, big 
statement piece. Um, but it was funny if it's Victorian brickwork, which, which I thought it was a strange piece to write. But then when we started to get the brass down on it, we started to think, actually, this is quite, this could be quite special. Um, you know, it was very much even listening back ourselves. It was kind of like, oh, there's moments here that are giving us a sort of tingle factor. And that's always the thing. If you can find the tingle factor in a song, then, you know, you, that you're, you're getting somewhere. So we were quite excited about it. Um, we were excited that we had a new, a new, a new voice to the band. We had the brass band coming on board. So it was very much a new start. Of course, we had Dave Gregory on board as well. Um, so things felt very exciting, but I, we had no no comprehension whatsoever how that would, album would take off. You know, I, we went from selling, you know, a few thousand to 20,000 plus quite quickly. And um, it was just, it was it was a, a crazy time because we were, we were shipping them all from our home, our homes, you know, mm-hmm. and um, so it was a it was a lot of work as well, um, but suddenly that it began. It just we just began to feel a chink of light for the probably the first time really that well, maybe there's something in this. I mean, I was um, you know, I was working in a, a homelessness manager's job in local government at the time, and so you know, after twenty years of um, doing music, suddenly I began to think, you know, maybe this maybe this could become you know actually my career, my job. Um, it took a few more years for that to happen, but nevertheless, you just began to sense something changed. People's um, people's kind of um, perception of us had certainly moved to a different level. Um, so yeah, but I but I honestly, we as as it says in the book, we released it on st- stupid time of the year, fifteenth of December. I uh, had no real clue about the music business, all of those things. So it, it was whilst we thought we had a good album. I don't think Andy and I had any prospect, any idea of how it would, would take off for us. Yeah, yeah. It's um, uh, you talk about send, sending out all the albums yourself. I mean, how uh, um, uh, how do you feel about the the kind of Marillion model uh, that they've kind of set up and sort of circumnavigated all the the, the main labels? Uh, um, yeah, just... we're we're in awe of them. I mean, they've they've done something magnificent there, yeah. um, and you know they're they're def- definitely a hugely influential act both in terms of the music but also the way that they've managed uh, and evolved into um, a sort of modern music world and have done it more successfully probably than, than anybody else really um you know the fact that they're back in or at the albert hall now mm-hmm. um after their long backstory with lots of lots of ups and then some downs and then then the, the position that they are is is remarkable and um you know i think we all um we all take our hats off to them. I've just done a little piece for Record Collector about them. There's a special coming out, and um, mm-hmm. it took me back to buying the Market Square Hero single when I was 17 years old. And you know, yes, I got excited that, one. that there was a new, a new sort of prog, you know, a new prog prog scene coming through that um, that I could engage with um, rather than the one that had sort of gone a few years before. So yeah, no, they've been they're brilliant. They're brilliant. So when they're everyone brilliant. at when everyone at the party in the 80s was listening to Tube by Army, you were listening to Marillion. Yeah, I mean, I, I famously killed a, a pub um, New Year's Eve party by um, putting, you know, we were, everyone was putting party music on the um, on the jukebox, and I ended up choosing Moribund the Burgermeister, um, and that happened to come on just before just before midnight. <laughs> <laughs> the whole room went cold. Um, so, you know, I've never been a follower of fashion in that respect. I've never really cared about being fashionable or any of those things. I, yes, the only thing I really care about is just, is, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the songs that we write. And, I, you know, the, the thing for me is getting those heard by as many people as as are there to hear them, uh, are there to enjoy them. That's That's been the goal all along, really, I think. Uh, I've got to ask you, actually, I can't resist it. I mean, what was it like? Uh, didn't you work with Robert Plant or? Mm. Yeah, that was um, that was a, that was an astonishing moment. Uh-huh. Um, you know, we were, <clears throat> as, as you know, I'm a big Francis Dunnery fan and we became sort of um, friends over the years. So he invited us up to, he does this charity thing up in Cumbria and he invited us to headline um, the shows, a small shows, 400 seat uh, venue um, and we were, were only going to take the we couldn't afford to take the whole band up so it was just a like a folk version of us really four of us doing it 
anyway, a few a few weeks before we got um, told that we'd been stepped down from headline to uh, uh, the the just below headliners because of Robert Plant, uh, a mate of Francis had agreed to do a gig uh, for there. So we were like, wow, Robert Plant, poor old Rickard. Um, he'd uh, he they Robert needed a, another guitarist, and Rickard was the first. Uh, port of call, someone that could play kind of in a, uh, uh, you know, not a not not a hair metal style. I think was the requirement, oh. um, but he couldn't change his flights that were already booked, and so he he couldn't get there in time to do the rehearsals. But so we ended up, um, you know, doing this uh, this show, and uh, Robert was staying at the same hotel as us. He was lovely. He came down and chatted away to us for you know half an hour, and. Um, David and him both being kind of front men and a little bit more um, comfortable in, uh, in, you know, talking in those sort of ways. Me and me and Rickard were like sort of school kids, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, David was uh, was much more kind of uh, just talking at his level. Um, but it's brilliant. It's fantastic. And we ended up singing back in vocals um, uh, for one song, rock and roll, I think, at this, this show. So it was just it was a, it was a real pinch me moment all, all down to francis dunnery um but an absolute moment of in my life where i came back on the train thinking how the hell did that happen you know what a yeah. what a crazy thing to to have occurred absolutely uh well zoom are telling me i've got six minutes left before they unplug me um i'm gonna get, get, maybe get a quick question in i was going to ask you uh, um, generally i'm so glad that this band is uh, is continuing and i was just wondering how alberto bravin have i said his name correctly bravin alberto bravin yeah, but a brilliant, I can't I can't roll my R's very much. <laughs> anyway, how is he settling in with all that old material, and you know, uh, how is it all feeling? It's feeling great. You know, I mean, it's obviously we've been through uh, a tra- I mean, literally a traumatic experience. Yeah. And um, so it's been a it's been a the last few months. You know, been focused on on David really, um, and then when we decided to carry the band on, um, you know, you start to to look look forward and, and start to think about how the band will sound going forward. Um, Alberto, I saw him at a gig in 2015, a PFM show in London, and and I just I, I he was singing the the sort of tougher songs to sing for PFM, and I was just sort of thinking, crikey, why why is that guy you know at the back of the stage? He should be the front man he's amazing so I, I actually just made a note of his name in the book not because I felt David might leave or something but because I was thinking of maybe a solo project I would um you know I, you know I was keeping notes of people that I wanted to work with so when um you know when a few months after David David died we decided to carry on and we started to reach out to see who um who we wanted to join the band um or wanted to audition um Alberto was the, the first name on the list for me and um he passed the audition with flying colors um he's bringing uh he's what i love about him is he's thoughtful um he's a family guy he's totally respectful of of what's happened within the band um and you know we're going to try to um to carry the band on with the respect that david deserves um but also he's forward thinking and wants to to look to the future as well so it's been a it's early days you know we've only we've only spent a couple of days with him there's been an awful lot of things going back and forward in terms of zoom calls and file sharing and stuff and, and getting ready for the gigs in September. But so far, you know, it's been, uh, it's been something I needed really because um, the last few months had been so distressing um, yeah. to have some more positivity in, in my life has been a, a good thing. something I, I needed. Sure. Sure. Well, I'll repeat what I said at the, um, the beginning, but I'm just so glad that you, as a band, that you're, you're continuing. Um, Greg, I want to thank you for, for taking the time to do this interview. I wish you the best of luck with the, the gigs that you've got lined up. I think you're playing the HRH Prog Festival as well. Uh, I, I, wish are, best, yeah. I wish you the best of luck with all that. And, uh, thank you very much. And um, just enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Barry. Take care. All the best. Cheers. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.